Sure good to be with you again tonight and everybody looking in on live stream and here in God's house. Let's turn over to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter number 3. And when you find that scripture address, let's reverence the reading of the word of the Lord together tonight. As you stand in reverence of the infallible, inerrant, holy word of God. Lamp to our feet, light to our path, Psalms 119, 105. Oh, given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16 is profitable. And we are able to break the bread of life together tonight and gather around the Lord's table and hear what thus saith the Lord. So God, would you please give us your word now to our hearts, to our minds, as we read it together. Hallelujah to your holy name. 1 Samuel 3, 11. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. Look at that word tingle. <laughs> it's a slight or a strong sensation of uh, like a pricking sensation or a stinging sensation that goes through your body. To be like tremors causing excitement, anticipation, or expectation. And that could be expecting the good things of God because God is speaking His blessing. Or fearful about impending judgment because God will not be mocked. For whatever you sow, Galatians 6, you're going to reap. And so will I. Numbers 30, 32, or 32, 30. I get mixed up on that a lot of time, but I know what the scripture says. It says, be sure. Your sin will find you out. Amen. So there's a tingle. Now, chapter 7, please. And verse 10. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering... The Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them and they were smitten before Israel. So tonight, right out of the word of God, a tingle and the thunder. Before you sit down now, the Lord thundered with a mighty thunder. I don't think we have to define thunder, do we? <laughs> that is a loud, understandable, recognizable uh, uh, voice or sound in the heavens, rumbling sound, a powerful sound. You know what causes it? By the expansion of heated winds colliding into them. Acts 2 said there was the sound of a mighty rushing wind. I'll tell you one thing, what we need in, in America more than anything else is a direct divine intervention by God Almighty into this situation. Amen. So a tingle and the thunder, thank you for standing in reverence to the reading of the word of the Lord. Now let's get back just a little bit. We will try not to be long in preliminaries. Man, the Lord just took over last night. Didn't he read the Bible? I don't know what. I, well, you just had to be in here. But God sure spoke. Not only did the little gentleman uh, get saved, but there were others here under conviction. And it takes the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, except my father draw someone, they can't come to him. And, and your pastor was sharing with one another today. Come under conviction. God got a hold of him. I'm glad he got a hold of me one day. Drawed me to a saving knowledge of the Lamb of God. Got born again. Now if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away and behold, all things become new. Now you go back to chapter 1 of Samuel and you're introduced uh, to this man Eli from the 
a Levite, a descendant of Aaron, uh, a man that was basically going to be a transition from Joshua's day uh, into the times of the, of the judges. But let's just pick up verse 9. And we know the story of Hannah, and I hope everybody in here does. But pastor, it amazes me still, after all these decades, and I'm sure it does you, how that so many of us don't really know the Bible. We were talking about Dr. Lee Robertson today. And I remember when I was a boy, him saying to us preacher boys, don't think people know their Bible, they don't. And I remember thinking, now who is I, a little old 17, 18 year old, know nothing. And there's a man of God at that time, he was probably 60, whatever it was. And I thought, now wait just a minute. Don't tell me that the church going folk don't know the Bible. <laughs> I'm telling you, the longer I live, the more I know old Doc had her peg just right down the line. So I'm taking a, 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 even churches that have a pastor that preaches the word of God. He can only be used of God as under shepherd to feed you so much. You're going to have to learn to eat for yourself. <laughs> Now, I love my little babies, and you did too, and when they were growing up, I mean, we had to, you know, had to feed them, had to do all that, but then one morning, I got up one Saturday morning, they had cereal screwed all over the kitchen. But that's a good thing, they're starting to, they're starting to look up, get it yourself. So you've got to, as Peter said, as the Spirit through his pen, you've got to desire the sincere milk of the Word so you can grow thereby. And when this Bible becomes what it is and who it is, you will fellowship with Jesus when you read this book and the great teacher, the Holy Spirit, who is the author of it. For the prophecy came not of old time by, will of men, by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of the living God. I I believe it this literal. I believe that those human secretaries dipped their pen in the inkwell, laid their hand and pen over their own apartment, and it was the Holy Ghost of God that did the writing. This is forever settled in heaven. His word can't be broken. So read it and study it, and not just be a hearer of it, but then be a doer of it. So here's the story. It's shallow. This man of God, Eli, Hannah comes to Shiloh in verse 9. And after they had drunk, now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. That word Shiloh, it means his peace and his prosperity. God is the provider of peace and prosperity. One of the brethren was talking about that uh, when we came in tonight. I know there's a lot of... Uh, ministers, I guess you could say, out here in the world, and especially back in the 90s, uh, that's interested in not what they can give to the people, but what the people can give to them. And it used to be, boy, if you love God, you'd have Rolex watches, and you'd have diamond rings, and you wouldn't drive a Chevrolet, you'd have a Lamborghini, because God's blessings were manifested through you by what you had in your hand. Now, you've been told all these decades that that is not found in this blessed red back book that I'm holding up here. That come from somewhere else. Strange fire, call it whatever. But let me tell us all, and I know I'm just reiterating what you all know, but the most important thing ain't what you've got in your hand. Most important is who you have in your heart. And when your body became a temple of the Holy Spirit, when you were saved by the grace of God, then you became an heir with God and a joint heir with Christ. Shallow, you've got His peace. In the Colossians said He made peace by the blood of His cross. And to the Ephesians, what did the Spirit move Paul's pen to say? He is our peace. We were at enmity with God. We were enemies with God. Adam's fall because of his unfaithfulness. He fell. And because of the fall of the first Adam, was alluding to that last night, we lost everything that God Almighty had intended for us. But when the second Adam was born of the virgin and paid our sin debt and come bodily out of that grave on the third day, ascended to the pinnacle of authority where he ever lives making intercession for us, we have 
now regained everything that we lost in the fall of the first Adam. We've got it back now through the faithfulness of the second Adam. He said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Everything that we need, He is. And now the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit gives us the character of Christ. And that's the fruit of the Spirit inside of us. The love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering and the faith, and the gentleness and the goodness and the meekness and the temperance. Everything that is the character of Christ. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit and walking in the Spirit, not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh, then that inward character of Christ through the Holy Spirit manifests itself inevitably and naturally through your Christ-like conduct. And conduct cannot create character. It's character that promotes, produces, and perpetuates the conduct of Christ from all of our lives. Hey, we live like Him because we were made one. And we are, and Romans 8, if we're led by the Spirit, then we are the children of God. Talking about Shiloh. He's our peace. He's our prosperity. What does the Bible teach you? Believe it's 2 Corinthians chapter 8. He who was rich became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. I don't need the dollar bills printed by the U.S. Treasury. I've got access to the treasure house and the storehouse. <laughs> hey, glory to God, you can't buy love. You can't buy purpose. You can't buy joy. You can't purchase this peace. I don't know all these big shots that owns uh, Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff. They're going to the outer space and everything else. I don't even know what their names are. But you look up here. I want you to know that I am an heir with God and a joint heir with Christ. I don't have a lot of the things of this world, but I have access to the treasures of the Word of Almighty God. I didn't deserve it, neither did you. But He had pity upon us. He had mercy upon us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. He loves you and now constantly as your best friend, as your great high priest, he allows you access to all of his assets. (laughs) Simultaneously he covers all of our liabilities. No, we don't know what exactly will happen to us tomorrow, but we know who's going to be right with us. His word is impossible for him to lie. Hebrews 6, 18, he said, I'll be there. I'll never leave you. I'll strengthen you. I'll help you. I'll uphold you. So if I end up in an ICU somewhere, God's going to be there with me. Put a tube down my goozle. Now you Upper East Tennessee people know what a goozle is, don't you? At your throat. I said that somebody said, what's a goozle? Well, I feel sorry for you, honey. Everybody ought to know what a goozle is. If they put a ventilator tube down my goozle and I can't even talk to my wife or my children or any church member or anybody else, I'm glad, thank God, I got an open communication line of prayer with God. As we said last night, He's our great high priest. He gave us salvation through His merciful grace and then He maintains that which He invested in. (laughs) Hallelujah to God. He's able to keep that. What Paul said to the young Timothy, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. So they were at Shiloh. Now that has to do with the promise of Messiah. Now as I mentioned there, uh, all the patriarchs of old, they didn't fully understand these promises. Abraham embraced them and he believed God and his faith was counted for righteousness. Uh, it was, uh, the, God told the devil, Genesis 3.15, the first mention of a redeemer. I'll put enmity between your seed and seed of the woman. That's, in, that's, that's the enemies of God. But now we're friends with God. And we are of the family of God. Because Christ abolished that middle wall of partition. <laughs> he took the handwriting and the ordinances that were against us and nailed all of that to his cross. And he died under the, under the, under the demands and, and contents of the law. 
and his soul descended as we said about Sunday night uh, as our perfect sacrifice for sin and then arose with our justification and he ascended to glory where he ever lives as the believer's high priest and the head of the church and the savior of the body and he ain't going anywhere so he's right there where you are all of the time and he abolished that enmity took all of that handwriting nailed it to the cross and then reached out with loving arms and blood dripping hands saying come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest now yes the serpent was able to bruise his heel but he bruised the Satan's head Satan's the serpent's head Sunday night the devil the last thing about it he was defeated and the thread of truth runs all the way through this Bible. The blood of Jesus, the love of God, the mercy, the offer of grace. For it is by grace that we're saved. It is by grace that we find the sufficiency to walk, to talk, to have our being. For everything that we are, we are in Christ. Always be led of the Holy Spirit and make sure that old hateful human spirit is not dominant in you whatsoever as a Christian. Dear heart, if you're here tonight lost, the devil, the world, and even that old human spirit of yours will tell you to wait. Improve your life first. Get yourself worthy. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. When can you stop sinning? Never. So if you have to stop sinning in order to be saved, then when will you be saved? Never. That lying, thieving, subtle snake does his job. But Noah, when he blessed Shem, mentioned this promise. And when old Jacob, Israel, was down in, in Egypt, and he was blessing all the kids, he looked at Judah, and he said, Judah, you're going to be a lion. And the scepter's not going to depart out of your hand until who? Shallow comes. Revelation 5 5, y'all know that verse well, don't you? Nobody was worthy to break the seals of the judgment. And old John was crying, but the voice said, Weep not, John, for the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed. And all judgment is committed to the Son. That's why I can't judge you, I can't condemn you. Only Jesus can do that. And I don't want to be so proud and arrogant and ignorant like they were in Jeremiah's day that they would trade the wellspring of living water, the Lord, for old broken cisterns that couldn't hold water, wiggled tails and everything else and them nasty old cisterns years ago. I wouldn't want to drink out of those things. But to when the people of God at any historic time has enough ignorance and arrogance that they think they can do the job without God, they're going to find out they cannot do the job without God. And God is who's blessed our nation. And when you begin to turn away from Him and hear all the rhetoric and stuff that's going on in this world, but shallow reigns. And He is coming back one of these days. So let's look at just a few things out of this story. Now we're talking about... The tingles and the thunder. <laughs> I hope God will get a hold of us and we can have all kinds of tingles are running. All kinds of tremors are running around. I felt a few of those little tingles sitting down there when that brother was, those brothers were singing them in together. Thank God, yeah, we're saved by faith, but every now and then you can feel it. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, are they? So this priest, Eli, but oh, little Hannah, we may come back to her if we have time. But you see, it was Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. You remember the story of the four older boys? Reuben got in trouble with his sin. So it wasn't passed to him. The scepter wouldn't give it to him. And then look what Simeon and Levi did over their sister Dinah. So now the fourth one. And old Jacob says the scepter's not going to depart. Till Shiloh come. We are talking about the Lion of Judah, God Almighty, Jesus Christ, who was dealing with his people here in Samuel. He would deal with his people in Jeremiah and Isaiah's day. He would deal with his people in post-captivity with 
Ezekiel and Daniel in the captivity and then with Esther and then with Haggai, Zechariah, all the different minor prophets. He would deal with his people through the last 2,000 years and he's still dealing with us here this evening. And the hope of America is not a Democrat or a Republican. You know the hope of America is our God. And he has ordained under the auspices of his church to get his work out into this world. Mark 16, 15, he said plainly, Go ye therefore into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. So here we go talking about this uh, judge, this priest, uh, old uh, Levi, e Eli. Uh, let's look at some things over here in chapter 2, I guess it is. Uh, about verse 22, just, to, just for a few minutes about Eli. Now, let me say he became bound. Listen, God's people, if you're watching on television somewhere or if you're here tonight, verse 12 of chapter 2, look at this in your Bibles. Now, the sons of Eli were sons of Baal. They knew not the Lord. Can you imagine people ministering in the temple in the work of God and they didn't even know God? Can you imagine such a thing? It happened then. And it's happening now. Jesus would call them hirelings. Not his pastors, but wolves in sheep's clothing. And so now the man of God, Eli, who honestly had some strong points, and he ministered for 40 years, but we can't rest on our laurels. It's like Psalms, I believe it's 77, about Asaph that was leading the singing and, and the music in the, in the temple in Jerusalem, and the next day you had neck irons and leg irons being led over into Babylon. We don't know what circumstance or situation we may face, but we know whatever, we know who's going to stay with us. And he said in Isaiah 41, 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Ezekiel went over before Daniel did, and God blessed him. And then Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and, and Hazariah, they, they oh, uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar changed her name to Belshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The world tried to change our name. They don't know who we are. <laughs> Sing us a song now, Asaph. He said, well, let me get my heart out of the, out of the boughs of this willow tree, and I'll stroll along the banks of the Tigris, you free deep. And I'll sing a song of Zion. Hallelujah to God. Sing in the midnight hour. Anybody can sing when it's pretty at noon time but when it's cold and stormy at midnight when you strum that harp and sing that psalm I'm telling you you'll get heaven's attention and God will bless you that old king said, take this wine and meat. Daniel said, nope, I ain't going to have nothing to do with that. I ain't going to drink the king's wine, and I'm not going to eat the king's meat. And the eunuch said, now I'm responsible for you. Oh, Daniel said, just check me out. Give me some good water and vegetables. You begin weigh me every day. Brother, I'll be all right because God has made me to be. So we don't have the spirit of fear in 2 Timothy 1, 7, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Praise the Lord for a spiritual mind of Christ. Praise the Lord for a sound mind that won't be overcome of evil, but will allow God to use you in your divine partnership with Him to overcome evil with good. Well, I already mentioned it once, might as well mention it again. The Sermon on the Mount, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So here is a man of God who, watch that wording there, he became bound. Now from verse 22 on down through those verses, he, you got, he, was, he became inactive. You got to keep praying. You got to keep believing God. Don't let up, give up. Don't wear out. Don't turn around. You put your hand on the plow. Luke 9, don't look back. Keep on going. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, in verse 23 of that chapter, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. And don't let the devil, the world, and the flesh manipulate or mess with your mind. 
Wasn't no time to they. John said, We see people out here doing miracles in your name, and they wasn't doing it like we do it, so we forbade them, Lord. Jesus said, John, if they're not against me, they're for me. Went on a little bit further, and that. Did they get that? No. Wasn't long as saying, who's the greatest in the kingdom? Peter, James, and John. Which one of us is going to be number one? Yeah. Even their mamas were doing the same thing. Uh, Salome and, and, uh, and Which one of our boys is going to be number one, though? Sitting that first seat over. <laughs> Tip went right over their head. Jesus said in Matthew 11, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I'm meek and lowly in heart. And I'm sure he gets frustrated at my faithfulness sometimes. He tries to teach me through the Holy Spirit, through the sacred scripture. And I'm just like John. It goes right over my head. It goes right around the corner and do what he told me not to do. <laughs> well, I told him, Lord, they ain't doing it like I do it, so I told him, quit. <laughs> Why, Jesus is still Lord, you ain't John. Then they won't know which one of them is the best. And Jesus got that little baby sitting up there and said, you've got to be totally dependent and trust in me. You've just got to put your faith in me and trust in me. Was that enough? Did they learn anything from that? The Samaritans, he had a scheduled meeting in Samaria, and they were going there, but he'd already been in Samaria. They had a mighty meeting in John 4. Now that's where interpretation and communication comes in. I heard the Samaritans saying, Lord, you go on to Jerusalem, do what you got to do. You're the offspring of Israel. You're Shiloh. You're Messiah. You have come to die, not to reign. You've come to suffer, to give us salvation. It's okay if you don't stop here. You go on to Jerusalem. Now here comes James and John, and they misinterpret. I'm sorry, low down Samaritans don't want us to have a meeting in their town. And they looked at Jesus after those other two incidences. Now they got a third incident in Luke 9. What did they say? You want us to be like Elijah? We'll call fire down out of heaven and kill them all. Jesus said, boys, I didn't come to destroy the lives. I've come to save lives. So don't, we're not being so hard on Eli. But he's like a mirror that I can see myself in him here. So you got inact, he got become inactive and inattentive. Uh, verse 29, if you want to mark that. And then ineffective. Look at verse 13, and there's many other verses we could look at, but right down below the tingle in verse 13 of chapter 3 for I, for I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not so there's the priest Eli he became bound and then what else he went blind he could not see how sad and how tragic that his eyesight was dim and he was unable to see. Can I say to Mike Sage a lot of times, I can't see the things I need to see. Look on the fields, they're white already to harvest, Jesus said. Mention Samaria, let's just mention that in John 4. When he was talking to the woman at the well, it seemed like it offended the disciples that he would dare compromise the integrity of their witness by talking to that low-down woman. But boy, I'll tell you, when she got a sip of that water, she went running downtown and said, Come see a man! <laughs> that's what Knoxville, Tennessee, that's what yay, every town in America needs. Somebody say, Come see the man! He told me all I ever did! Those disciples said, Master, eat. He said, boys, I got meat to eat that obviously y'all don't know anything about. <laughs> and about that time, here she come. I can imagine a little head bopping up over the horizon there on that old dusty street at Sycar, and she was giving it to us. Come on, folks, come on. She had old Shifty Henry, one-eyed Lefty, and all the rest of them from the pool halls and everywhere else where she was <laughs> out down there. Brought them all out there. And Jesus ministered to that whole crowd, I'm telling you. Praise his holy name. See right. Jesus said, don't say there yet four months and then comes harvest. Look on the fields and get your heart filled up with compassion. Let's get a positive tingle going on. That we got, no, we got a job to do. 
that the laborers are few in Luke 10. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he'll send forth laborers into his harvest. So talking about Levi or Eli, I keep saying Levi. Eli, the priest, he became bound and he went blind. But in chapter 4, verse 18, he got a little too big. Boy, I tell you, pride goes before a fall. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. The first thing he despises and hates in Proverbs 6 is a proud look. He became bound. He went blind. And he got a little too big for himself. Does that sound familiar? So there's the priest. Now let's look at the people. Hophni and Phinehas were children of Baal. They were supposed to have been ministering uh, for God, but they had forgotten all about God. I want to show you something tonight before we go any further. I want you to look at something here. They go out in battle against the Philistines. And amazingly to them, the power of God was not there. And so they lost those first skirmishes. Technically and in reality, they lost the battle against their enemy. And they were really shook up about that. I love America, don't you? How many honestly loves our country with all your heart? Would you raise your hand up there? And you're not like this bunch that wants to point out. Yes, we've got sins in our past, there's no question. But it's the ideals of that flag that we honor. Sometimes the human element within the governmental hierarchy can do dastardly deeds. And we know that and they do that and they've done that. But that doesn't mean that we hate on our country. Because our nation has certainly been good to all of us. And we want to hold to those ideals and principles. That every person is created equal. And in our representative republic that God has blessed us with. Thank God back in, you know, we don't, we're not like they were back under the Church of England. Some of you have been talking about Virginia history. You know that a Baptist preacher was killed for his faith in colonial Virginia. You know that our first governor, Patrick Henry, pro bono represented an old Baptist preacher that was in a prison in Culpeper, Virginia because pre- he was preaching the gospel without a license from the Anglican Church. Young Patrick Henry that would give that speech, give me liberty or give me death. He rode into Culpeper that day and he saw that preacher and the ruffians were cutting him up. He was preaching the gospel through the jail, through the jail bars. A bunch of ruffians going up and cutting him up everything. And he just asked a question. What, what crime hath this man committed? And they said he's preaching the gospel without a license. Henry said, what license does he re- is required? Yeah. License from the Church of England. You mean to tell me that there's a hierarchy of religion that's got to license a man from their own church to preach the wonderful gospel of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ? <laughs> so he defended him. He became our first governor in Virginia. I wish we had him back. Now he was, him and some of the others, uh, you know, they, they split from Washington and Madison and all that, uh, you know, because of a big central government. There's a little bit of free to that. Maybe they might have had a right idea. I don't know. But we've got some ills in our past, but I believe we've got some positives in our past and we need to love our country and pray for our country and pray for our leaders and be thankful for our nation. But if something doesn't happen rather quickly tonight, Temple Baptist Church, I don't know what's going to happen. And like I said a few minutes ago, not just from the Word of God, but from history itself. And when there's no fear of God before people's eyes and they become wise in their own selves and and professing to be wise, they become fools. There's still a holy, righteous God that's watching all of this. And we are the remnant. We're the salt. We're the light. And revival's not any of the business of this world out here. Revival is the business of God's people. Will thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? If my people call by my name will humble themselves and pray. You can't get to sinners and people that don't even know God. They don't have any part in revival. They need redemption. But it's God's people that we need a move of God. 
Now watch this. They got out there on that battlefield and they were losing the fight. Remember that? Now watch this arrogance. Now watch it in your Bibles. It's going to be in chapter 4 and verse number 3. We've already established the fact from the Word of God tonight that Hophni and Phinehas were children of Baal. We didn't read some of the scriptures tonight because I try to be a little sensitive to the, to the younger people. But they were having relations with women in the door of the house of God. But it doesn't get any worse than that. And all the superstar preachers of yesteryear, a whole bunch of them was in the pulpit preaching, fleecing the, the sheep and a feeding their old fleshly lust at the same time. But God ain't mocked. You mark one thing down, brother, if old Mike says he's doing stuff I ain't supposed to do and I'm a claiming I love God and I'm a God's man, I'll tell you, God will jerk me out and put me right under a big spotlight and he'll say to everybody, look here what he's doing. God's holy. He's righteous. And we need to respect God with all of our hearts and souls. And like we've already quoted Titus 2, verse 11 and forward, God's grace teaches us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And don't have anything to come out from among the world. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. And God, we've got the righteous robes of Christ on us. Like in the Garden of Eden, I heard an old preacher say one time, he believed that God looked at the devil and said, all right, big boy, you thought you had a big victory and you stole their innocency. Yeah, but I'm glad you did because I've robed them with the promise of the righteousness of Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah, he'll take those filthy rags. But we still got to stay humble. Paul said, when I would do good in Romans 7, evil is present with me. So we can't rear our shoulders back and say, oh, look how good I am and look what, look what we've done. Look all this, that, and the other. This is our thing, our church, our singing, our this, that, and the other. I hate to say it, but I'm going to agree with your pastor. I've heard him preach enough to know. Brother, he just he plows that road, just straight and air, and he got a big plow and a big auger and going down through there. Keep it like you, brother. I'm, you ain't going to change. But praise God we stay humble. I appreciate one thing he said to me today. I'm still learning. I am too. <laughs> old saying, I believe he said it the other day, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. You got to get yourself humble and stay humble because if it wasn't for God, you'd still be lost. You'd have to be in hell. I tell you, we owe God everything. Love Him with all our heart, soul, and mind. Praise God for Deuteronomy that says the eternal God is our refuge and underneath us are His everlasting arms. And He said to get after the enemy and He'll take care of the enemy and He'll fight our battles. You need to trust Him. But when you turn into a Hollywood uh, religious outfit, that ain't God. Sometimes I hate to say this, but it's the truth. Sometimes, and I'm not talking about Temple Baptist or Freedom Tabernacle Baptist. I'm talking about the church, the General Assembly as a whole in America. In the last little while, we've got so Hollywoodish and so showboat. And we forgot about broken lives and lost souls. So many times, my experience, when precious, precious people need their church the most, they can depend upon it the least. Somebody having trouble with their marriage, for just example, they couldn't help the man or woman just took off. And in, in my lifetime, I've seen not even let a little woman sing in the choir. She couldn't help her old man, her old man, her husband, her old man. And then because of our camp or our group or our crowd, it's like Peter James, boy, bless God, I don't allow that around here. Boy, ain't you big shot. Quit trying to elbow in God's... Sometimes we need to have compassion and forbearing one another in love. That ain't condoning sin. That's having pity and compassion on precious souls. He had compassion on me. There's nobody perfect. And we try to pick, 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 pick. So many times I preach about those chickens and other preachers do. You know what old chicken is? Peck, peck, old chicken eat anything. That's a fact. When I was a little boy and my grandmother was dying of cancer and we moved in. Granddaddy had a little old farm. I don't know a whole lot about chickens, but he had a, 
uh, chicken house and it's my job to take care of the chickens. I found out one thing when I was a little boy, you don't run your hand under a sitting hen, I promise you. <laughs> but I guess granddad had about 40, 50 chickens. I loved every one of them. But there's something about a chicken. There's people that won't eat venison or won't eat elk, but they'll gobble down a chicken and a hog. I was telling you, Pastor, we went to, left Tennessee Temple, went to Liberty when Liberty was just starting. And I was a youth pastor at church and up there, and, and one of the members was really heavy into poultry and sold chickens to Holly Farms and the, uh, things like that, big time chicken. And he asked me one day, he said, have you ever seen a chicken house? I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> he said, what's the biggest chicken house you've ever been in? I said, well, I guess my granddaddy. He said, how many chickens you had? I said, 35 to 40, 50. He said, you, you want to guess how many chickens I've got in one of my chicken houses right down here below the church? I said, I don't know. He said, make a guess. I said, you got more than 50? <laughs> he said, try 32,000. I said, oh, come on. <laughs> I'm not... I might not be the brightest bulb in the chandelier, but I ain't the dimmest, and you ain't got no 32,000 chickens in your chicken house. I went down there to Carr's Poultry. That beat anything I've ever seen in my life. And that's back before the days of OSHA. I'm going to be real quick. We're going somewhere with this. And uh, OSHA, don't, but you couldn't get by with this now. But we went to back of that chicken house, and it was huge. And he had three of them. Had a, had a bulldozer and, and a loader. And as pushing, I thought it looked from a distance like bloody snow. I said, what in the world is that? Big old pile of stuff. And the old guy with the dozer pushing, the guy over at the loader digging a big hole. It's burning. We got close to that pile of dead chickens. I said, what in the world? He said, we're, dying. we're burying all them crazy chickens. I said, well, what happened to them? I wouldn't be like 19 years old, but I said, had some kind of disease or something. What happened to him? He said, they pecked one another today. <laughs> now, I'm telling you the truth. I said, what? He said, yeah. He said, if they'll see a little blemish or something on their buddy over, they'll go, that little head will go peck, peck, peck. And said, they ain't got, you know, they ain't got a big head, so they ain't got a great big brain. <laughs> so when they're pecking that other chicken, the blood's splattering back on it. And when the blood of their buddy that they're pecking splatters on them, then another dumb chicken comes along. <laughs> so you got one chicken pecking another, and then one chicken pecking another, and next thing you know, you got a problem in the chicken house. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? We ain't, we're supposed to be sheep following the shepherd, not a bunch of crazy dominickers are pecking around on one another. <laughs> War to be forgiven, not fault finding. <laughs> Now we got a boy out of Atkins, Virginia that's in the Virginia Agriculture Department. And some of you probably know this. You think I'm kidding, but you check it out. Google it. <laughs> they start, now they take care, they de beak them somehow. Now I know if you're an environmentalist and you're one of these, you know, bleeding hearts that thinks dumb brutes act like humans, I ain't no sense me talking about that. Because <laughs> if you think that, you don't need talking about it. So they've solved that problem in the poultry business. Now, I'm talking about when it was back in the early 70s. But they ran an experiment. experiment. It started in Alabama. You know what they did? One old biologist said, I think I got a solution. And he got some little, like, uh, glow, like uh, the, pay, the, the lenses that goes on like the uh, uh, lights, a little lenses, and uh, red. Got a red one. And said, I believe if I could make a little pair of glasses or a hood to where old chickens will see through a rose-colored glass or a red glass, they'd stop pecking one another. <laughs> Run the experiment, put them rose, put that pair of rose-colored glasses on that little chicken. That Dominecker didn't peck that other one again because he's looking through a red glass. <laughs> oh, you know what that is. You know, God, you look through the love of God and through the blood of Jesus, the same God that had mercy on you, and you'll be merciful yourself, and you'll have mercy to other people. 
But I tell you, God doesn't want us in Isaiah 40. He said, if you'll just wait on me, you'll mount up with wings as an eagle. You know what an eagle is? Symbol of our country. I mean, on my best day when I was a kid, one of our old Rhode Island Reds or whatever it was, if he'd get a real good run, he go <laughs> and take off at the top of the bank and, and glide down the holler. He might have got fence post high on his best day. <laughs> oh! I saw him release an eagle one day that had been injured and been in captive for, for rehabilitation. They let that big old bald eagle go. And that, he, took, he bounced off. That rock, he climbed up on a little old rocky thing there and he took off. And just with ease, he, he spread those wings yeah, and yeah. started circling. And every revolution, every orbit, every time he went around, he getting higher and higher and higher. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, he just a little black dot way up yonder. He can see a fish. They can see a trout in a stream from, they say, like 10,000, 15,000 feet. I'm telling you the truth, they're just an amazing animal. And I'll tell you what, they see things regularly that a chicken ain't never going to see. <laughs> well, glory, just about had a fit. God wants to bless your life. He don't want you to hang around in misery doing our, your thing your way. Now watch this, they had pride and the audacity of these people. Living in, in sin and so sincere in believing they could manipulate God. What did they do? Bring the ark. That was a symbol of the presence and the power of God. We won't take no more time about that. You know what the ark of the covenant was. But God didn't bless that unless it was operated under His dictates and terms. There wasn't a godly priest there. Hophni and Phinehas dared take that ark to the battlefield. And with full anticipation of God's participation. Like the Laodiceans were rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And Jesus said, you don't even know that you're poor, blind, wretched, miserable, and naked. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, so you be rich, I salve, so you can see, and white raiment, so that the shame of your nakedness wouldn't appear. That's the shame of that old first Adam. That's that old human spirit uh, portrayed in the people of God and, and forsaking the righteous robes of Christ. Instead of living holy according to the Holy Spirit, we live unholy according to the human spirit. Now watch this here, watch it. You're looking at verse 3 of chapter 4. And we'll get on down near the end. They had smitten us this day before the Philistines. Watch this. Let us fetch the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us. Now watch this. That when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. It ain't a it. That's going to save you. It's him who's going to save you. That Ark of the Covenant was an Old Testament representation of nothing more than the Lord of hosts and the captain of our salvation, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But their thing, their way, and God didn't put one spark out of that Ark. They got overtaken. There's the priest. There's the people. And now little Ichabod comes along for the Spirit the glory is departed in verse 21 of chapter 4. So for the priest and the people, and now 20 years and what, 20 years and five months, 20 years and seven months, but time passes. Hannah had prayed and believed God and brought her little boy to God. Samuel had grown up in the house of God, hearing the word of God. And becoming the man of God. The work may be disrupted because the workers at that time may fail. 
But the workers will be buried. But the work will go on. One day, if the Lord doesn't come for His church, me and your pastor Charles Lawson and old preacher Mike Sage won't be among the earthly land of the living. But God will have somebody. I'm excited to death about these little young preachers coming on. Because I was a kid one time. And I've seen a many of an old blessed preacher that helped me. And they've gone on. And I was young once. And now I'm getting older every day. But I ain't never been forsaken. And I ain't never bagged bread. <laughs> I might not be wealthy and powerful and have all these things. But boy, I've got heavenly treasures in this earthen vessel. And now, 20 years, 7 months have passed. And we'll close now with the power of this thunder. Oh, look at the change in these people. Now we go back to the people. We got the priests, the people, and the power of God. But the power of God came because there were people that was faithful even in the beginning. Give us a mother that'll pray. Give us daddies that'll pray. Not be like uh, Eli and excuse things. But, and that doesn't mean that we're perfect and our children will have to make their own decisions. But by and large, they're going to come back. I've got three children. One of them is just my right arm. I mean, that's all there is to it. He's faithful. He's right there all the time. And uh, my two little grandkids that he has. And they're right there on the platform just doing all they can do. And my one daughter, she's kind of like me. She's kind of in there, but not, you know. She's watching tonight, so i got to be careful. And then we've got another, and she's living her life. So you don't know we all have our burdens and problems. Every single solitary one of us. No messenger is perfect, so quit looking for perfection in other people. If you want to find perfection, well it up in your own life. You take care of yourself and let everyone else take care of themselves and we'll come together as God's people and we'll love one another because God is our God and we need to be God-like and Christ-like as strong as we possibly can. Now watch the transition. They have changed now. What did they say here in chapter 7? They called on Samuel to pray for them. And Samuel said, look, put away all these strange gods. Change it. Serve the Lord only. Put away Balaam, Ashtaroth, and all that. And gather yourselves to Mizpah, and I'm going to pray for you. And so they gathered together at Mizpah at the watchtower. And Samuel started fasting, but look at their holy, or praying. And look at the people fasted on that day. Look at this holiness rising up. They're fasting. They're, they're resisting the flesh. They're weakening the flesh. And their repentance, we've sinned against the Lord. And then the Philistines heard that the children of God gathered together. Now there's their holiness, but now second, look at their humility. Instead of being so bold, come on out here and let's bring the ark and let's get this victory. They were afraid of the Philistines. They were afraid of the Philistines. But they were practicing holiness. They had got into the state of humility. And Samuel said, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And here came their help. And God thundered in verse 10 with a great thunder. Hallelujah to God. All the way to Beth Car, he set up those two stones uh, and in the middle between Mizpah and Shin. Mizpah, the watchtower. Man, God is our high tower. He is our watchtower. He is our strong tower. And then that rock of Shin was pointing up. Are you hearing this? God is our protector and our preaching ought to be about the cross and nothing but the cross. Jesus have said through the pen of old Paul, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And in between he set up that Ebenezer stone. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. And let me tell you as we close tonight, your preachers told you for decades, you've known it for decades, God is our help. He is our 
our high tower. He is our strong tower. We don't have fear, but let us have faith, not no faith, not little faith like we was talking Sunday night, but may you allow God to well up in you a great faith in an almighty God. Not a little faith in a puny God, but a big faith in an almighty God. He said over there in Luke 2, there's nothing impossible with him. And if he could get himself into this world through the miraculous virgin birth, and he could conquer death, hell, and the grave, there's nothing, as Jeremiah 32 says, too hard for God. We've got, as in Ezra's day, a little space for grace. The tingles and the thunder. You can have some tingles bit toward this world, and you'll never have divine thunder in help in your situation. But if you'll let the Spirit of God move upon you and start to stir you like Paul was on Mars Hill, his spirit was stirred within him. And he saw that inscription to the unknown God and he said, let me tell you about that God. He's the true and the living God. And that presentation of the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Our country is in trouble. And when they brought that it, they said, bring it. I don't want to be mean tonight. And I don't mean to be. Your pastor wouldn't have let me come down here if he didn't think I was a man of God. And I say that humbly. But it ain't Trump that we need. It's God. It ain't no political activism. It's God that we need. And the Ark of the Covenant is none other than Jesus. And Bethel I hold in my hand. (laughs) This is a sharp two-edged sword. It's the sword of the Lord and Gideon. And when we pray and when we go forth with this sword, I'm telling you right now, God will bring people to himself. He can do amazing things through his conviction. That's the thunder. That's the power of God. And the people were blessed because they got holy. They became humble. And God helped them with a mighty intervention. And if it happened then, it can happen now. Because God's the same tonight as he was then you got a few tingles tonight I did when that brother was singing (laughs) but it's the moving of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said let there be light and there was light and you as the church you are the children of light you're not children of darkness 1 Thessalonians 5 you're children of the light so let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. And never forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day's approaching. Jesus said, the night's coming when no man can work. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. So let's get busy and let's get on the wall. And God bless you. The tingles and the thunder. Man, I'm feeling some tingles. I'm just waiting to hear the thunder from the throne. (laughs) And God do something mighty in our country and in and through his church. Would you please stand to your feet if you're physically able and the musicians come tonight. You have been so gracious and so attentive. God bless you. I appreciate that. You that are looking in, wherever you're looking in from. If you're not saved, the greatest victory that was ever won was when Jesus died for our sin and was buried with our transgressions and he arose with our redemption. To him and to him alone be honor and glory now and always. Be saved if you aren't. And then those of us who are saved, love him, love him. Deuteronomy chapter 4 down in verse 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God and Him you, you, you serve alone. Only Him. Only Him, no one else. And you love Him with all your heart, soul, and might. 
God, we love you. We appreciate you. We appreciate the privilege of being here. And Lord, handling your precious, precious word. Now, God, you have spoken. Your people have used this altar every night. And I pray, oh God, that they'll move into this altar right now and pray, seek your face. God, many of them may have situations, circumstances they're going to turn to you. Some may have lost friends, loved ones, family members, whatever it is. But I pray, oh God, that your people will be found humble about this altar again tonight. And if there's any among our number lost, that they would be saved. Oh God, we pray in Jesus' name. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Our brother's going to sing prayerfully. Would you join us around the altar tonight? God's people several already have. God bless you for moving, being sensitive, just seeking the Lord. We got one more night, and I pray that God will just richly stir us. But that's tomorrow night. That's 24 hours away. Right now, right now, how are things with you? As God's people come to pray, as God's people move, you're here, you say, Preacher, I know the Lord died on the cross and I believe He rose again, but I'm unsettled and uncertain and unsure about my salvation. And I want to be humble and I want to be honest and I want you to pray for me tonight. Would you lift your hand and let this old preacher pray a prayer for you tonight before we go? God bless you again tonight, sir. God bless you. That touches my heart. I've prayed for you today several times. Jesus prays for you. And I'm sure you believe the Bible. You've heard preaching. But you are obviously under conviction. You're thinking about it. Get it settled. Get it settled. This dear pastor, we'd be glad to pray with you tonight like he did to the brother last night. Dear God, I can't go back there and pull this one. But you're pulling. Obviously, Lord, there's a concern there. And so I pray, God, they'll just take that first step and make that faith walk down to you here at this altar tonight. You're right back there where they are. God, I believe they take that first step. You'll take them right in. There'll be confirmation down here at the altar. But God, I'm going to be still. You're working. And this one's thinking. And I pray they'll stop thinking and start walking and come to you tonight in Jesus' name. Sing there, brother. Sing this song, a verse and a chorus. And then the pastor will close. But you that lifted a hand, I just prayed for you. Would you please come on? Get it settled tonight. We love you. You're going to make us the happiest people in Knoxville, I promise you. <laughs> We're going to be tickled to death. Come on, praise God. One's coming, Brother Charles. Would you pray with this one right here? He's a coming right there. You probably know whatever might be the situation. You can work that out. Praise God, whatever situation, whatever need is. Praise the Lord, whatever the need is, God will meet the need. Would there be others you need to move, need to move? You don't have to raise a hand. If you're not where you need to be with God, come on. If you're not where you need to be with God, come on. Get it settled tonight. Get it settled tonight. We got tonight, we may not have tomorrow night. And I don't say that scaring somebody. I say that because it's true. I say that because it's true. We just gathered around to praying at the altar, believing God, getting things at peace. Lord, give him peace tonight. Touch his heart. Give him peace. Give us all peace and purpose. Thank you, God, for moving in this revival. Thank you, God, for showing yourself mighty and sweet and powerful and loving and merciful, but righteous and holy. Oh, God, you're manifesting yourself so sweetly. We can feel those tingles, God. We just want to hear the thunder. <laughs> Bless your holy name all across our country. Oh, Lord, we pray for the bastions of uh, lies and falsehoods. We pray for all of our states. We pray for all of our state legislatures. We pray for our federal government. We pray for our local governments. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 
Boy, I tell you, you can't make this up. You can't counterfeit this. This is the real thing. Praise His holy name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Yes. Sweet assurance for this dear one tonight in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. I'm glad for you, brother. I hope you got peace in your heart. Praise God. You walked that out for him. He'll always be bless you, honey. God bless you. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Pastor, would you close as God directs you, brother? I don't know about you, but as the pastor comes, I want to thank him publicly right over the airways for giving us this privilege of being here with y'all at Temple. Thank you, brother, for letting us be here. I thank appreciate you, for coming, you so brother. much. God bless you. Thank you for coming.